Hey, welcome back everybody. Uh, this should be a really good uh, Soapbox Sunday here because along with just a few random topics today, I'm going to give an update on the Zeus preamp build that I'm working on. And uh, I know a lot of you have been asking me about it and when it was coming and what, it, what it's all about. And so you'll learn a lot more about that today. So stay tuned. At any rate, I um, thought I'd talk about a topic here called therapeutic electronics. And you may say, well, what the heck is that? I had somebody ask me recently what I really enjoyed about electronics. And um, in my response back to him, I said, it's very therapeutic. It, um, you know, I, you sit there building something or soldering something or maybe trying to diagnose a problem in a circuit using a multimeter or a oscilloscope or whatnot. It's just one of those things that, I don't know, I'm in my zone, I'm having fun, I'm not stressed about it at all, and it's uh, one of the most therapeutic things that I do. Um, you know, some people play golf, some people uh, knit or crochet or whatever, you know, for their therapy. Um, for me, it's electronics. I just, I love uh, being on the bench, doing something, whether it's breadboarding or testing or uh, you know troubleshooting or whatnot so uh, hey if no other reason to get into this hobby you might could uh, Mike should consider that it's one of those things you know I used to play a lot of uh, online games and uh, role-playing games and whatnot and that's, that was very therapeutic as well um, but sometimes they could you find what you find out is they can be stressful uh, <laughs> and I just don't find that with uh, with the electronics so um, any rate, I just thought I would throw that at you. All right, I think I titled this one, If You're Not Right, Does That Make You Wrong? And I uh, thought it was an interesting topic of debate. I uh, follow a lot of groups, Facebook groups, forums, uh, whatnot on the internet around this hobby. And I see a lot of people that, you know, in their head, they're right. And thus, the other person is wrong. Um, and it's not often that way. There's often a story somewhere in the middle, and maybe both of them are right, or maybe one of them's just slightly wrong, um, but directionally right, you know, things of that nature. I just, uh, there's a lot of keyboard warriors on the, on the internet, you know, that are very quick to point out flaws in other people's theories, or, uh, you know, take one little assumption piece of something, and because that's wrong, everything else about that uh, that topic is wrong, you know, and uh, and I think they just sit back waiting to see something to, to kind of pounce on it and uh, use their keyboard warrior skills to call pe other people out. I wish, I wish people on the internet and in these forums were a little more kind to each other, a little more tactful in their approach. You know, it's one thing to say, Aunt, that's wrong. It's another thing to say, hey, I noticed you said A, you know, A, B, C, but have you thought about maybe D? Um, you know, maybe just give a different perspective or a different point of view, a vantage point on it uh, to get people thinking versus just slapping somebody in the face and saying, you know, you're wrong. Um, you know, it's one of those, um, I always, I always tell people that work for me over the years, you know, uh, don't bring me a problem without some possible solutions. Um, and I feel, I kind of feel the same way about when somebody calls somebody out for some, for being wrong, you can't just say they're wrong. Um, you've also got to kind of give a point of view on why you think they're wrong and why, why what you're thinking is right if you're going to call something out. So, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's one of those soapbox topics that gets under my skin from time to time. I see people throw these things out there, you know, it's like, well, I would have done this or, uh, or, you know, that's not right or whatever, you know, they just kind of, kind of cold slap uh, without a lot of context or reason why. And, um, you know, I think, I think there's an opportunity for, for all of us uh, kind of internet uh, users to be a, uh, a little kinder and gentler to each other and maybe a little more helpful and supportive, uh, a little more constructive and building each other up than always wanting to tear other people down. That's just my thought for the day. All right, here we go. Some fewer builds. Andrew's building the KT88, looking good. Done it. A, built, looks like he's building it a lot the way I did, and he's kind of in the middle of it here, making good progress. Danny in a similar place, starting to get his things laid out. Um, said he was waiting on transformers. He's overseas, and it's taking a while to get them. 
Um, Frederick built the 807, and I'm very impressed with this one. Went with the uh, monolithic monolith magnetics transformers. Super amazing transformers on that. Um, Haken, Hawkins, uh, KT88, and I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Looking really good. Really sharp on the inside here. Wired up quite well. Um, then we've got Hitchum. Check this out. KT88. Nice little chrome transformer covers. Used a triordal. I think he used triordals in the output as well. And finally, the one that blows me away. Look at the aesthetics on this. Perry built this. It's just mind-boggling. Um, <laughs> I don't have the skills for that. I'm sorry. And finally, it looks like Brian here is building the Analog Discovery dummy load setup. Uh, looking good. Uh, excited to see how that one turns out. All right, finally a uh, much overdue update that I'm sure many of you have been waiting on. Uh, an update on the Zeus preamp. Uh, that's the preamp I've been breadboarding now for uh, about a year, year and a half, and uh, playing with it on the bench. Um, the primary construct around this um, preamp is going to be um, four 6SN7s, two per channel. It's going to have basically a cathode follower input buffer, then an SRPP kind of uh, gain stage in the middle, and then another uh, cathode follower buffer on the output. And I've designed it in a way that uh, really there's only one coupling cap um, in the amp on the output. Um, you kind of got to keep your, uh, your voltage um, off your RCA jacks feeding into the next stage. So it's pretty much a, uh, a capacitor-less, uh, coupling capacitor-less design. And uh, that was part of the, part of the uh, kind of MO of what I was building. Um, and then it was to couple that with a, uh, and I actually decided to go solid state power supply in this scenario because I wanted to get really, really clean. And I also wanted it to be fairly simple and uh, um, easy to construct. So um, where I've been at with it, I breadboarded it on the bench for about a year, played around with it, uh, took a schematic with me to the uh, Richmond Ham Fest, uh, ran into Dennis Had, talked to him a little bit about it, got some feedback, um, a few things he would recommend maybe me take a look at, which I uh, greatly welcomed. Um, so did a little more breadboarding post having a conversation with him. And then here a few weeks ago, I, I was pretty solid on the actual amplifier, the preamp itself. It was my power supply I was kind of scratching my head a little bit on. I went down a path with a... Uh, what they call a Buddha uh, kind of suppressor network after the uh, rectifier. And um, so I posted a uh, copy of my schematic up on one of the well-known um, audio boards uh, where DIY builders hang out at. And I said, hey, I'd like your input on this uh, kind of uh, pre, you know, preamp power supply. And some people pointed me down some directions I really hadn't thought of, to be honest. So I'm using the collective minds um, to outdo my one little mind here. And I started exploring. And um, let me just tell you where I'm at with this thing, okay? I've decided to kind of stick with the preamp design as kind of being a little bit of my creation there. Before the power supply itself, or I would say the rectification and regulation in the power supply, I think I'm going to go with kind of an out, uh, kind of an off-the-shelf board um, that you guys could just buy and put inside of this, um, and you'll you'll find out more about that after I've uh, had a chance to uh, test that out well. Um, but that'll make the power supply build on this much much simpler, um, and it will produce some high-quality results, I think. Um, and then the same thing a little bit with. Um, uh, then you'll go into the preamp itself, kind of do your amplification. And then I've had a lot of people kind of hitting me saying, Mark, Mark, I really wish this preamp would have a phono stage to it. And let me talk to you a little bit about phono stage. Let me grab my breath here. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, vacuum tube phono stages. So in theory, if you get a schematic for one, it's not that complicated, okay? It's just a typical voltage gain stage or two, just about like any other uh, amplifier. However, matter of fact, um, you can go to like the RCA receiving tube manual, and in the back of it, there's uh, several schematics here. This is high fidelity preamp for um, phono pickups, and I can tell you this, this little schematic here, 
has been uh, used in a lot of modern day uh, preamps that are commercially available. So, um, but um, I guess my point is the circuit isn't the complex part. It's the, um, it's really the build aspect of it that gets uh, somewhat tricky. So if you think about, um, you're dealing with teeny, teeny little bitty signal levels at the uh, at the phono cartridge level, typical five millivolts or less uh, thereabouts, and um, at that level, a lot of things can come into play and interact with your phono stage. Um, so you know, uh, electromagnetic interference coming from maybe a transformer nearby. Um, you can have some induced um, kind of signals coming from uh, possibly wires running nearby. So the placement of running wires, the twisting of your wires for your filaments, um, the shielding of your tubes, there's a lot of things that really matter from a physical standpoint when you go and start dealing with phono stages. Matter of fact, some of the older ones that you'll see um, and things like uh, Fisher gear, they'd actually have that little section suspended with some rubber grommets just to help with microphonics and whatnot. So here's my decision point. Based upon all that, because, because kind of where I'm at is, I might could show a schematic and people might could go build it. And while they built that schematic, um, they may still not have success with it. There's a lot of tweaking and considerations to take into place. And I'm just afraid if I made a video series on how to build this preamp and I put a tube phono stage in it, a lot of people may struggle in that tube phono stage. So kind of where I'm headed with this is I've decided to go down the path of a solid state phono stage, a, uh, a FET based, um, a field effect transistor based approach that will use kind of what I called earlier a standard off the uh, shelf uh, board that you could buy that you could drop into this unit mount it on some standoffs uh, build a little power supply for it there and um, if you wanted to have a phono stage for this preamp so kind of think of it as a modular approach um, you know we'll build it with the uh, the tube preamp stage uh, which has all the good um, kind of input and output buffering we would want um, as the gain stage we would need. And then from a modular standpoint, if you want to add a phono stage, you just bolt one of these units in. And by the way, if you wanted to add a moving coil stage to that, um, it'd be another little board that you would bolt in and run off the same uh, power supply. So uh, I'm not going to divulge exactly which boards I'm using right now because I'm actually trying a couple different ones out, uh, both with the power supply and with this uh, phono stage. Um, some of them are fairly well known out there in the industry. So, uh, but that's kind of the approach I'm gonna take. It's gonna be a little bit of a hybrid solid state slash uh, tube amp. I think we'll get some of the best of both worlds. And I think it'll be somewhat of a, uh, you know, a not too complex design to be able to put together. So hopefully you followed along with everything I've just said and uh, that's kind of where we're headed. Stay tuned. I'm getting some of these parts in right now, kind of starting to build them, uh, testing one against another uh, kind of popular brand of things. And we'll see where that leads me. I think I, think I know where I'm going to end up, but uh, it's too early to tell that yet. So uh, stay tuned. Stay tuned. This is my next big project, and I promise it will happen. I'm actively working on it right now, and we'll kind of go from there. Thanks for listening. And I thought I'd leave you with a couple things that I've got on my plate right now that, uh, you know, along with this preamp while I'm waiting on parts or uh, different things. A couple things upcoming I thought would be, of, you know, it's just based on questions people have asked me. Um, feedback I've gotten and whatnot. A couple topics I thought might be very helpful here. One, I thought I'd make a video talking about different types of tube testers because I get a lot of questions from people saying, hey Mark, I'm looking at buying a tube tester. Should I buy this E-Tracer? Should I buy a um, one of the computerized Western Electric? Should I buy a TV7? Should I buy an ICO 667? Should I go get a Hickok? You know, and they're saying, you know, wow, what would make me pick one versus another? And a lot of it comes down to what do you want to do with it and what are you going to be using it for? So I thought I'd make a video on that topic to hit, you know, from kind of low end tube testers to the very high end 
and the differences between them and what which ones might fit different scenarios for you so you could you kind of map out the scenario that fits you best and say ah oh, this is the one that would make sense for me so you can leave me some comments below on what your thoughts are around that okay a second good video i think would be on triode versus ultra linear circuits um and a power amplifier and i know a lot of people this has been covered many times, okay, but I think it typically gets covered at a technical depth that may fly right over people's heads. So I thought I might try to bring a real kind of pragmatic um, explanation to it with some analogies that could try to help people understand it a little better. And uh, so they could uh, kind of really, you know, understand behind what what's behind ultralinear versus triode mode. Third one up, I thought, along the similar lines, what in the heck is the difference between resistance and impedance? Um, that's another one that could get covered at a very technical level and right over people's heads. So I try to bring a real pragmatic um, aspect to that as well. And then the last one, you know, I've had a lot of success with my TV7 calibration video. I just thought I might do a, a video on the ICO 666 and 667 um, calibrations. So I've got I got quite a few of each of those laying around here, and I thought and they're really good tube testers. There again for a certain scenario, um, and so that that's on the docket. Anyway, just some things I had in them up on my board over here that's coming up. I thought I'd give you a little bit of teasers. Um, lastly, I'll leave you with just a little bit of a health update. Um, Things are going along pretty well. Last weekend, I did spend the entire weekend back in the hospital. Um, started having some chest pains Friday night. Thought, oh my gosh, I'm going through this heart attack thing again. Um, ended up in the ER, spent 10 hours there, got transferred up to the, the uh, kind of the uh, cath, uh, uh, the cardiac unit. Um, spent a day there, a night and a day. Come to find out, I've got something called pericarditis, which is basically a swelling um, inflammation of the sac around the heart, filling up with fluid. Um, and they say it's typical about a month out from a heart attack and stents being put in to, uh, to get this, if you're going to get it. And But the good news is it's treatable. I've been on some anti-inflammatories, and that's helped a lot. Um, so I'm feeling good this week, um, maybe even better than before I went into you know, the hospital the second time. But, hey, we're making progress, still chugging along, um, starting cardiac rehab now. And uh, hopefully I can sneak my way back into the office at work a day or two a week here coming up soon. So at any rate, uh, I'm going to leave you guys with that today. And uh, thanks for watching.